Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Acts, going through Acts, uh, not verse by verse, but uh, a survey of Acts. And I believe that we left off in our last video, uh, it's somewhere around verse 23 of 22 or 23 of chapter 20. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your word, for the time that you give us to study it together. We just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is the truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've seen some remarkable things in this survey uh, as we've uh, gone along. We've seen the grace of God in the direction of the lives of His people. We've seen the ministry of grace, the gospel, uh, the persecution that follows the presentation of that gospel. We've seen how Paul in his missionary journeys is going around encouraging and strengthening and edifying the church, the, this new uh, thing called the church in the first century. I think it helps sometimes if we try to step in our little time machine and go back in, to that time and try to put ourselves there Instead of trying to filter everything through uh, a 21st century oaky mindset, uh, for those of you who don't follow this channel, uh, I live in Oklahoma. We Western Christians tend to just look at the Bible and forget about context, forget about the historicity, uh, the historical aspect of it, Try to find some present day application in every verse that really is where the, we've torn it loose from its original context, historical context. We don't look at it in that, that, that framework. And I think that's a huge mistake. We are Westerners. We're not Jews. We're, uh, well, maybe there's a few Jews watching this video, but but we are not first century Jews who expected the Messiah to come and deliver them from Roman occupation, who failed to understand that He came as a suffering servant. He'll come again as a conquering king. They sort of missed the first part. We're looking forward to the second part. Of course, that turned out not to be the case. And I guess what I'm saying is, is I, I don't think that we should be as critical as, as we might tend to be toward these first century Christians, and I, whether they were Jews, Greeks, uh, whoever they were. They were zealous for the traditions of the, their fathers. They were zealous... Uh, as far as the law was concerned. You know, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, even though the, San, the Sanhedrin didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead, they were strict, strictly uh, those who, well, they were, they, they were those who, who strictly observed every minute detail of the law. You know, it seems like the, the as far as intellectually, uh, the intellect goes, they were to be com commended for their, uh, I guess, their dedication, you know, to the law. It's just that their hearts and their minds were in the wrong place. We've seen nothing but Paul go around preaching the gospel that Christ rose from the dead, 
that his work was sufficient, nothing to be added. We've, we've looked at baptism and how uh, we ta I've talked a little bit about baptism and how you know the word means identification. It was primarily uh, for the Jews, not the Greeks, not the Gentiles. So picking back up at, at verse 20, uh, or 22 of chapter 20, uh, Paul is going to Jerusalem. He's not aware. He's, he's not, he doesn't know what is going to happen to him when he does go back. He's, he's already given a number of sermons, uh, some of them in the temple, to God's people. Uh, the, the reaction hasn't been all that great. And in many cases, they, they just wanted to take him, take Paul out and kill him. We, we see God's direction in the life of Paul and moving him from one place to another. What we have seen is, is that God, God the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul and the ministry of the Gospel is reaching out with the truth of the Gospel to His people. He's not calling goats you know, to become sheep. He's not putting a message out for goats to become sheep, but for His people to hear. He doesn't know what's going to happen to Him when He goes to Jerusalem. He only knows that in town after town, the Holy Spirit had warned him that, that chains and afflictions, uh, persecution awaited him. He said that he considered his life of no value if only he could finish his course and complete the ministry that he had received from the Lord Jesus. That is the ministry of testifying uh, to the good news of God's grace. compelled to go where you don't know what will happen except you know that there will be persecution. There is no avoiding it. It exists everywhere. This is a, a period in Israel's history in which, or in world history, you might, you might say, in the whole history of this whole program of God in which there is a transition taking place between law and grace. Why did he say but I consider my life of no value to me. I mean, we've got to stop and think about that. That doesn't sound very correct. I mean, we, of course we are of great value to the Lord. Of course our lives are of great value. So what, what did he mean when he said that? Why of no value? Because no man, according to Ephesians chapter 5, which Paul would go on to write later, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it, cherishes it, even as the Lord of the church. I believe Paul is saying that my human soul, that's the word that we see in, in, the, in the Greek, the soul as the seat of affections and will, the self, a, a human person, uh, an individual is not, is not what I hold dear or precious. That's and this is literally how the Greek reads, that is not what I hold precious or dear. My own volition, my own will, my own person, my own self, my own affections, that's not what I hold dear. You know, life is a very valuable thing. Therefore, this has to be understood, I believe, as if the apostle uh, did not despise his life it must not be understood as if the apostle despised his life when it was the gift of God, but it has to be, I believe, taken in a comparative sense with respect to Christ and his gospel. Crucified with Christ, he would go on to write in Galatians, where the focus is on Christ, not self. He goes on to say that I know that none of you among whom I have preached the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. 
I don't know how many times I've pointed out in videos that we are not responsible for those who don't hear. Under grace, that is, that is absolutely not true. Uh, why would Paul or the Holy Spirit be compelled to, uh, to, to write through Luke, the author of Acts, concerning Paul, those words. I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink back from declaring to you the, the entire will of God, the whole will of God. Now that could not be said under the old covenant, under law. In fact, under law, it was just the opposite. This is a solemn appeal to the elders of the church at Ephesus who knew that Paul's doctrine and manner of life for a cons was for a consider considerable time while he was among them consistent with everything that God's Word had said. He was pure from the blood of all men, or, or of you all, as some versions read, uh, that the ruin and the destruction of no one of them could be laid to his charge or anyone perish for want of not for want of knowledge or through any neglig neg negligence of his as God said to his people in Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 6. I'll read that. Uh, but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. The problem here, dearly beloved, is we're not under law, but under grace. I cannot be held accountable for someone perishing under grace. Of course there's no blood on our hands. Verse 28, Keep watch over yourselves and the entire flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers be shepherds of the church of God which he purchased with his own blood I know that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock even from your own number men will rise up and distort the truth to draw away disciples after them therefore be alert and remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day, with tears. Folks, there has been a never-ending conflict between law and grace within the body of Christ since the church began. This is where the conflict lies. I do not believe that Satan is roaming about trying to, to find ways to put Christians into hell. I don't think he can do that. But what he can do is he can direct your focus away from Christ to self. There, therein is, lies the conflict. That's where the conflict lies. If you're a Christian today, then you're, you're under grace, not law. And Satan will do, and his emissaries will do anything they can to try to direct your attention away from where our focus ought to be which is Christ to self. Human effort, human performance, human strength, human will, human decisions, human autonomy, human everything. It's because it's Satan's turned Christianity upside down where it's all about you and it's not about him. This is what we see all the way through this book. Now I, in verse 32, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, it says, which can build you up and give you an, an, an inheritance among all who are sanctified that is set apart by God. To the word of his grace, the gospel of the grace of God, some, sometimes called the word, uh, the word of faith, uh, the word of truth, the word of righteousness. Uh, of reconciliation and salvation. It is, it is His Word, the Word of God. It is not man's Word. It comes from Him. It concerns Him. 
It's the word of His grace since it proclaims His free grace and mercy in Christ and declares salvation to be holy of a work of God by the grace of God. And it is to this that the church is commended by the apostle as a rule of faith and practice. We are to attend to it, abide by it, because why? Because it delivers us from those errors and those heresies which, which he had observed would spring up among them. Grace for their instruction. Grace for their comfort. Grace for their establishment. The law, folks, does nothing but condemn. In verse 33, he says, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You know, when you turn the TV on today and you watch some of these TV evangelists, uh, you would think that they'd ne never read that verse. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have ministered to my own needs and those of my companions. And everything I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I'd, I'd say that, that kind of puts to rest any question concerning the ministry being a, a profit-making uh, venture. And, and it, if it's the gospel we're preaching, it won't be. The Holy Spirit deemed it important to point out the character of false teachers that would come in or spring up among us who would make merchandise of us. But if it's the gospel that we're preaching, that won't be the case. When Paul had said this, verse 36, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept openly as they embraced Paul and kissed him. They were especially grieved by his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied, they accompanied him to the ship. And you know, it's one thing to be separated from the world system. It's quite another to be separated from the brethren. And, and that by God determining that we be someplace else. Because he leads and guides and directs our every step. God can do with us what he wants. We have been bought with a prize. And surely that uh, in these verses, verses 36, 37, 38 of chapter 20, we can see the intimacy that exists between believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. That takes us into chapter 21, Paul's journey to Jerusalem. Uh, he, he, so he, he tears himself away from them, sails uh, directly uh, to these different ports and uh, finding a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, uh, boarded it, set sail. Uh, after sighting Cyprus and passing south of it, they sailed on to Syria and landed at Tyre where the ship was to unload its cargo. Uh, they sought out the disciples in Tyre. That's what they did. They sought out the disciples. I believe that's a it's an ongoing activity in the life of every Christian. We, we seek fellowship with one another. They st stayed with them seven days. The Spirit kept telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And when their time there ended, they set out on their journey. All the disciples with their wives and children accompanied, accompanied them out of the city. Uh, they knelt down on the beach to pray with us. After they had... Uh, said their goodbyes to one another. They went aboard the ship and they returned home. In verse 8, we see Paul visiting Philip the evangelist. Paul stayed at his home. He was one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. You've got to keep in mind that this is a time in which God was using Signs, miracles, wonders to confirm his message, to confirm the messenger. This is no longer 
the rule of operation today. We have His Word. His Word is complete. Paul, he used Paul to complete His Word. It's all based on faith. It's not based on signs and miracles and wonders. And so you had uh, Agabus. He comes down from Judea, coming over uh, uh, to Paul. He, uh, he takes Paul's belt. He binds it, his own feet and hands with it. And he says the Holy Spirit says that in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind him and hand him over to the Gentile. And so they pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Of course, Paul replies in the appropriate way. God had led him to, to Jerusalem. Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, they couldn't convince him otherwise, and so they fell silent and they said, the Lord's will be done. The Lord's will be done. After a while, they packed up, went on to Jerusalem. Uh, some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied them. They took, uh, they took them to stay at the home of uh, uh, someone who is an early disciple. And he arrives in Jerusalem where he's welcomed joyfully. He, he's welcomed joyfully in Jerusalem. The next day, he goes in uh, to see James and the elders. They're... The elders there and James are present. Paul greets them. He, he recounts one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. I don't know how long that took. It must have took some time. One by one, the things that God had done. That's what he talked about. One by one, the things that God had done. Not the things that Paul had done. Not the things that the, the, those that he had talked to had done. But the things that God had done. And of course, when they heard this, they glorified God. Then they said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. Stop. You've got to stop, folks, and think about this. Christianity is in its beginning stage. Most of first century Christians, most of them were Jews. And so naturally, they're going to be zealous for the law. Of course, we know today, we're, we know from, from a myriad of verses in the New Testament, particularly those in Paul's epistles, that we're not under law, we're under grace. It was, that was a big aspect, a big part of Paul's ministry. In so many ways, God, through the Apostle Paul, in the, in the letters to the churches, the very lifeblood of, of the church, made the point clear that we are not under law, but we're, we're not under grace, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet here in this. Keep in mind, this is, this is prior to Paul's writing those letters. You see, Paul, how many... you. They, they tell Paul, you, you see this. You see how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. But they are under the impression that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or observe our customs. What then should we do? Because they'll certainly hear that you've come. And so now here's where they advise Paul. And they say that there are four men with us who have taken a vow. Take these men, purify your, yourself among them. These were Nazarites. And pay their expenses so they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there is no truth to these rumors about you, but that you also live in obedience to the law. And now I have to apologize to all of you and say I've been wrong for... 34 years, we're really under law because here's a verse that says that 
Well, it, it would seem to pretty much discount everything I've ever preached concerning law and grace. Everyone will know that there is no truth to these rumors about you, but that you also live in obedience to the law. Now look at what Paul does. We'll see that in, in a moment. Verse 25, As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they must abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Well, that's a big, that's a, that's a huge difference between what, he just, what they just said there and what these Nazarites really were known for. They, not the things that they, that, that they mentioned here. They, they were known for, you can't, no alcohol, no, can't touch any dead bodies. No corpses. Makes you unclean to do that. Of course, we're to abstain from food sacrificed to idols. From, but we have Christ our Passover. From the meat of strangled lamb and animals, and from sexual immorality. And you can take that as physical sexual immorality if you want to. I believe it includes it, but I also believe that it extends beyond the physical into the spiritual of spiritual adultery. And this is what the elders at the church at Ephesus were telling these Nazarites. So, verse 26, what does Paul do? The next day he takes the men, purifies himself along with them. Well, Steve, I thought we were not I thought we were under grace. I thought we were not under law. Why is Paul purifying himself along with them? Then he entered the temple to give notice of the date when their purification would be complete. I believe that was seven days, and the offering would be made for each of, of them. I hope I can explain this. I'll, I'll probably do a pretty sloppy job of it, but I I let, let me at least try to offer this, okay? I, we studied through the epistles to the Corinthians, both letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And in, it was in those epistles that we came to understand that, well, we, we've, we've come to understand several things. One, one is that we're not under law, but we're under grace. That if someone invites you to dinner and they set something before you, you're you're to to for conscience sake, you're to eat it. If if you may have faith to eat all things, someone else may not. I absolutely believe that what we're looking at here is Paul in looking at the Nazarites, he understands Paul is not. I'm going to suggest that Paul is not, we, I can't look at Paul here and say, well, he just hasn't grown up yet. He, he hasn't come to the point of really realizing that we're not under law, we're under grace. And so he's made the error of purifying himself with these Nazarites, going along with them and what they're doing uh, be, for the law's sake, okay? Because he just he just hasn't, we're in that transition period and he just hasn't really fully grasped I'm talking about the apostle, the apostle Paul. He hasn't fully grasped the significance of us being under grace. And so he's ignorant. Paul's ignorant. He, he, he needs to, to, to grow up later on. He's going to grow up later on and write in these epistles that unless we die to the law, we can't live under God. You know, the entire epistle to the Galatians you know, that we've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer us who lives, but Christ who lives in us. All of these wonderful truths concerning law and grace, the issue between law and grace. Paul's just, he hadn't got there yet because he's kind of stupid here. And I don't think that's the case at all. What I think is, I think it's for conscience sake. What, what he said was, I have become all things to all men in order that I may gain 
song. It's, there's a huge difference in you doing something because you feel like you have to do it and doing something knowing that you don't have to do it, but you're doing it for the, for your, the conscience sake of either yourself or your brother. You don't want to ruin this brother's, defile this brother's conscience. Uh, we, we talked a lot about in the past uh, about scruples, uh, you know, we are, we are not under law, but we are under grace. So I, I, can, I can imagine some, some people watching this and saying, well, Steve, boy, you really, you slipped out of that one. I mean, you, uh, you explained that one away. I mean, you know. I don't think that Paul's in a state of ignorance where he's yet to come to understand the full reality of law and grace and how that issue continues in the lives of the believers. I think that he's doing this for their sakes. He didn't have to, but he did say, I have become all things to all men in order that I may win some. So the next day, Paul takes the men, purifies himself along with him. Now he's seized at the temple in, in verse 27. When the seven days were almost over, some, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, crying out, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches everywhere against our people and against our law and against this place. Furthermore, he's brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place, that was a, that's a lie. It's not true. Paul didn't do that. For they had previously seen someone, Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So the whole city was stirred up. The people rushed together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. Jesus himself said, to his disciples prior to his going to the cross, that they would put them to death thinking they were doing God's service. So while they were trying to kill him, the commander of the Roman regiment received a report that all Jerusalem was up. It was in a turmoil. Immediately he takes some soldiers and some centurions. He runs down to the crowd. When the people saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. He basically saved Paul's life, or God did through him, the centurion. The commander comes up, arrests Paul, orders that he be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. Uh, the commander, he couldn't get at the truth because of, of all the uproar. Uh, so he orders that Paul be brought into the barracks. Uh, and when Paul reached the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. Apparently, Paul was injured. The crowd kept following, uh, shouting away with him. And here's where Paul addresses the, the crowd. They were about to take him into the barracks. He asked the commander, may I say something to you? Uh... Aren't you the Egyptian who incited a rebellion some time ago and led 4,000 members of the assassins into the wilderness? Paul says, I'm a Jew from Tarsus. I'm a, I'm a, a Roman citizen. He begs him to allow him to speak to the people. So he's given permission to speak. Paul stands on the steps and motions to the crowd. A great hush comes over the crowd. And he addresses them in Hebrew, and he gives his defense before them in Hebrew. And uh, telling them he was a Jew born in Tarsus, uh, raised in a city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel in strict conformity to the law of our fathers. I'm just as jealous for God as any of you here today, he says. I persecuted this way even to the death, detaining both men and women, throwing them into prison, as the high priest and the whole council can testify about me. In other words, basically what he's saying to them is he's saying, look, 
you know, I, I did those things. You know, what you're doing to me now. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus. I was on my way to apprehend these people, bring them, bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. But then he, he goes into his uh, the revelation concerning his conversion on the road to Damascus. He explains, to, he goes into some slight detail concerning that conversion. Then we see Ananias, a devout observer of the law. Uh, he comes, stands by Paul, tells him to receive his sight. That was after he was led by his companions into Damascus blind. Verse 14, then he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear his voice. You'll be his witness to everyone of what you've seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Look, I was with Stephen when he was stoned. I was condoning this. I was giving my approval, watching over the garments of those who killed him. Rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live, yelled the crowd. I wish I had the words to express, dearly beloved, just how antagonistic law is toward grace. Uh, just there are no words. You could be zealous for God in the wrong way. Kind of better to be zealous for God in the right way. Because you can definitely be zealous for God in the wrong way. Even to the point of killing those for whom Christ died. They were shouting, throwing off their cloaks, tossing dust into the air. Of course, Paul gets flogged. And he's interrogated. They want to really un try to understand the reason for all this outcry. Paul claims his Roman right to a trial. He says, I was born the Roman citizen. The commander finally realizes, you know, with alarm, he had put a Roman citizen in chains. Verse 30, the next day the commander wanting to learn the real reason Paul was accused by the Jews released him and ordered the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin to assemble. Then, then he brought Paul down and had him stand before them. One confrontation after another. All the way through Paul's life. There never was a time in Paul's life, at least not that I know of, that Israel... The nation, God's people as a whole, basically said, at, together, collectively, said, oh my gosh, Paul, you're right, okay? You know, uh, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth really did come through Jesus Christ. <laughs> and dearly beloved, you'll never, I will never, I don't believe, you will never see modern Christianity today slap their forehead and go, oh, you know what? Y'all are right. We're not under law. We are under grace. No, the persecution will continue till you're dead. That's the way God intended it. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you go through knowing that the testing of your faith is, is worth more. It's more precious than gold. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for hanging in here with us through these studies and acts. We'll be back in that next Sunday, this Wednesday. Don't know what I'll be talking about, but tune in Wednesday in our weekday service. I love you all. I truly do. Until then, rest in Him. 
This is Steve. Thanks for watching.